fought with us. You know, he said, counsel with the Lord in all thy doings. He will direct thee for good. Yea, when thou liest down at night, lie down unto the Lord, and he will watch over you in your sleep. Yea, when thou risest in the morning, let thy heart be full of thanks unto God. If you do these things, you shall be lifted up at the last. Just as I love my, my children to come and say, Dad, hey, what do you think? Do you have any advice here for me? I think Heavenly Father would love, us to do, would love me to do the same. If I really listen to the promptings of the Spirit, that He can, he can help me. Okay. Uh, we're continuing to move on today. Um, we're, today we're talking about talking about the, the, your auto and your toy plan. So, again, if you'll click on this template, uh, go down to where it's the auto decision, and then you've got an auto plan and a toy plan. Well, what is your vision? Goals. Uh, what autos are your vehicles are you currently driving? What expenses and fees are you paying, including gas, maintenance, repair, insurance? What are your auto slash toy plans and strategies? So when I talk about toy plans, what am I talking about? Boats. Yes, yeah, boats, four-wheelers, <laughs> ATVs, things like that. Are those pretty expensive? Yeah, my son-in-law and a friend just picked up a boat, a wake setter, um, and I think the MSRP was like 175. <laughs> so, so realize these things, these toys can be very expensive. We have a boat, but I, I paid significantly less the power of a car, and it's a 20-year-old one. So, things like that. And then, what strategies are you going to use with your your vehicles and your your toys, such as? How often will you get a new one? New versus used, cash versus debt, negotiation, warranties. And then what are your constraints? So here's an example of a case study you might have. She negotiated the price of a car, and she's deciding whether to lease or buy. All of this information. Is this something you guys will, will come across? I actually had someone over my house yesterday, and we were talking about leasing versus buying. He said, you know, leasing's a really good thing. He says, I lease all my vehicles. Of course, he's a construction person. Uh, and so what's the, the advantage for businesses? You can expense off the lease payments. So is it different for businesses and individuals? I want to start with a story. I have a good friend. His name is Kermit McC McKinney. I, I joke that I'm the one who has the funny initials after my name, and he's the one who's got the smarts. But uh, he had noticed he and his buddy were thinking about picking up vehicles, and there was this two Dodge trucks, white, two white Dodge Ram trucks. And he noticed that they had been in the, uh, on the dealership for about three months. So we went and he <laughs> talked to him, and he and his buddy were willing to pay. He went and says, you know, I see you've got those two, two trucks out there. He said, well, you can give it to us for 18000 out the door. We'll take them both off your hands. What does out the door mean? Yeah, yeah so all few. So that means all taxes, tags, licenses, everything. So their price really would be 17 something. Um, and the guy said, you know, you're crazy. The MSRP is 25 on those things. And uh, I'll tell you what, but I'll give it to you for 24 plus taxes, tags, and license. So 24, and then you add your taxes, tags, and license on them. said, no, no, thank you. You're going to be 18 out the door. He says, we'll come back. You know, fast forward <laughs> another five weeks, two vehicles are still there. The fact that they haven't been able to sell it, are they adding value to the dealership? No. Now you get a hold back, the dealer gets a hold back to keep the, um, basically to reimburse for some of the costs. But, uh, but after, you know, you're, you're looking at four, five, and six months. He came in again and he says, you know, talk to the same person. He says, you know, I see you've got those two trucks there. When you can give them to me for 18,000 out the door. The guy said, you guys are crazy. He said, you're crazy. You can never, you'll never get it for that. Kermit said, not a problem. Here's my card. We can give it to both of them for 18 out the door. We'll take it. Fast forward about three weeks. I think it was the end of the quarter and also getting close to the end of the year. It's 5 o'clock. He got a phone call. This Kermit McKinney, yeah. So if you come down here in the next hour, you can have both of those vehicles for 18 out the door. And they got it. So are there better strategies to use when we are, uh, when we are, when we are purchasing vehicles and, and toys and things like that. So, a number of important topics we really need to talk about, um, such as, first of all, it's choosing a vehicle. Second key area is, before you go looking, 
And then the third one is once you have found it. So let's kind of hit each of these areas and kind of quickly. Um, choosing a vehicle. Know your vision and goals. It's really important that you understand what's your life and your life situation too. You know, if you're going to start, if you're having more kids, it's not a good idea to buy a, uh, a sports car, things like that. But we had an interesting thing here is, um, as we got, I worked in San Francisco. So it was my second startup firm. And um, the, the job was interesting because I got a base salary and a guaranteed bonus for two years. And the third year, we said, if we didn't make it, then we're, we'd walk and walk. So it was a high risk, high risk startup. But about the, the second year, we started realizing that it was, was going to make it. And you know, we'd been saving our 20% and we had the, and so I went out and we went and bought a Mustang GT. And it was kind of fun. And one time we were coming back with our seventh child, we were coming back, I can't remember where we, where we went to. But I went and got the car and then uh, we came out here, <laughs> drove up to the place and I put the top down, grabbed the car seat, put the car seat in, grabbed the baby, put the baby in the car seat. Closed the top there, went around, opened the door for my wife, and let her in the car. And the person there says, oh, you really do well with your first child. And we didn't have the heart to tell this was our seventh child. <laughs> but it was fine. But, but what are your visions? Does your car fit your budget or your budget fits your car? That's really a key question. Are you putting aside money each, each month to save for the new car? Because the car's full of entry for now. But you want to make sure that this is consistent with your vision and goals. Number two, pick a vehicle that's safe. So safer car, NHTSA, all of these things, with every vehicle you buy, you can actually go in and you can find out. Um, for example, again, I hyperlinked all these places in there so you can kind of go look at it. So shortcut search, so vehicle shoppers, um, vehicle manufacturers, search for recalls by bin, We actually, uh, Robert gave me his bin number, so I put that here, so we clicked on that. So no unrepaired recalls associated with this bin. So it's just important that you know, do a vehicle that's safe, um, and it's uh, safe to drive. Um, let me do one more story. Um, my daughter and her husband, they were going down to St. George, they were actually going down to Lake Powell. And they had a, a 19, excuse me, 2017 Escalade. They were pulling the boat behind it. Something happened to the boat trailer that it actually started with and flipped the car and the trailer. And they rolled three times. They walked all, everyone, they had three kids in there in their car seats, two in the car seats, and everyone walked away. And the only thing my son-in-law just sprayed his thumb. But the fact that they walked away says safety is really important. Um, be able with a good record report. So I've got a, I've got a um, subscription to Consumer Reports if anyone wants to come and use it. But th they do a really good job of figuring out which vehicles are the safe. And they'll go through each of the different operating systems, you know, the electrical and the suspension and each of those different things. So it's a really good resource to use. Uh, you can also get it at the library as well. But a good resource for uh, finding a good repair record. Insurance. Do you realize that each car has a number between 3 and 27? The higher the number, the more expensive it is to insure. So you can actually talk with your uh, insurance person and you can find your vehicle, whether it is a good, uh, how expensive. SUVs, high performance cars, much more expensive to, to repair. So be aware of that. And then also, which ones are more expensive to drive? So your miles per gallon and things like that. So those are important as well. Okay. So those are the things that you do as you're deciding to which car you want. Once you've made that decision, you have to decide, do you want to go in new versus used? Uh, again, those are three key areas, goals, preferences, and budget. New, vehicle, I mean, you guys know this thing. It's nice having a new car. It's nice, lower maintenance costs, fewer miles. The downside is just higher initial costs. What about those people who lease a new vehicle every two to three years? Uh, are the costs higher? Yeah, so not only do you have the new cost from the, the higher vehicle, if you lease it for three years, are the insurance costs the highest during that time period? Yeah. The depreciation the highest as well? Yeah. 
So, so realize there's cost to a lot of these things. Disadvantage, lower initial vehicle and insurance costs may help with other goals. We like our, our goal is, except for my wife's car, she gets the new car. At 130,000 miles, it becomes my car. So when we bought our other cars, we bought used cars, and then we tried to get a, uh, an extended warranty on those. Um, new, what you want to do is you want to get the dealer's invoice. How, um, how willing are, are dealers to share the invoice price? Actually, actually, I was surprised. So when we were looking at, our, at the expedition in 2006, um, we... Um, we, we just asked the dealer for the, the invoice price, and they actually gave it to us. We actually went online, based on, I, I can't remember if it was KBB or Edmonds or something like that, used all the things there, and the invoice price that they showed us with it was within $100 of the invoice price that we learned on the net. So I encourage you to, to know the invoice price, number of different places you put in the manufacturer model, options, and you can get the invoice price. So when you negotiate, where do you start? When you negotiate, you start from the invoice price. How about used cars? So this was this was a Mustang convertible. Uh, we felt that uh, we, we could afford it. Uh, work was going well. It was nice. There's just something about putting the top down and driving back from San Francisco to the Bay, to, to Walnut Creek that was just, just nice. So how about this? When you, when you have a new car, if you lease a vehicle, can you change the tires? Now, I actually exchanged those tires for, for some uh, Cobra R rims, and could you put things like a roll bar on it? No, you can't. But, but realize we bought this in the, from the Bay Area, and when we came up here to Utah, we live on a hill, and the first time it snowed, I stepped on the brake, and we slid about a third of the way down the hill. So <laughs> when it would snow, the, this car would be stuck in the Tanner Building parking lot for a couple of days until the snow would be. So needless to say, we sold it, we sold it with 88,000 miles, and notice here, so here's low to retail, average retail, high retail. And there's different places, NABA, um, KBB, Kelly Blue Book, and things like here. But the nice thing about this is it gives you an idea of when you're selling or buying vehicles. So it's kind of a good framework there. What's holdback? Has anyone ever heard of holdback? So what holdback is, it's a rebate to the dealer to compensate the dealer for putting it on the lot. Now the downside is you can't, you can't negotiate. This is not something you can negotiate with. But it's important for you to realize that even if you buy a car for a low invoice, the dealer's probably still making money on it. So, so be wise in, in that here. And then warranties. Know your warranty and period. So the warranty, full warranties or contracts require it to be fixed within a specific time. Won't be unreasonable to return the product and it'll be replaced. So, it, it bothers me when I see people who lease a vehicle for five years and their extended their warranty is only good for three years. The last two years, who's responsible for any, ch any changes during that lease period? The, the leaser, the person, the person who leased the vehicle. So, so be aware. Um, and then service contracts, is that a good idea? Are service contracts a good idea? Generally, what I like to do is I'll... I'll uh, so it's an agreement between the contract seller to uh, repair services to covered components within a specific point of time. There's uh, service, excuse me, service contracts that are, I, I like the ones put out by Ford or Chevy or things like that versus the kind of third party ones. But generally what we do in our negotiation for the vehicle, we say, okay, we'll pay you 150 over your cost. So we've had service contracts with Honda and Mazda and Ford and Basically, the, the, uh, the Honda's office is the least expensive. So uh, again, that goes with kind of the warranty stuff. But generally, in the process of our negotiations, what we've done is we've just, um, we just say, hey, we'll pay 150 over your cost. So they're still making some money. They're just not making as much money as they thought. Um, I like, uh, you know, when I had my Mustang, I, I like that. I think I replaced two transmissions. Never took it over 85, but we went zero to 85 really fast, lots of times. But um, but it, it was worthwhile for me. And, and generally, what I find is the more technology I have, the more risk I have. And so if I can do a service contract, it, that that's helpful there. So they, yes. $150 just over the cost of what they're asking right. for the Right. Yeah. What they were. No. No. What what they paid for it. 
So for example, one place, uh, their cost, their the retail price was $1,700 and their cost was $700, so I paid $850 for it. I won't tell you which manufacturer that was, but you can probably guess. So I realize there's significant markets on those. How do you figure out what their cost is? I, I trust them. You trust them? Okay. Yeah. And if, uh, if I don't trust them, then I'll go to another dealership. Um, Rise as a consumer. If you've made four attempts to fix the problem, the car was out of service at least 30 days in the first 12 months, you can actually take, take the car back and get your money back. So that's a lemon law. And what happens, what does the dealership do with it? They'll turn around and sell it as a used car. George? There's a good law on here that I encourage you to add. Um, about, it's kind of like a lemon law for used cars. Uh -huh. Very unknown. Magnus and Moss Warranty Act. Magnus and Magnus Moss. and Moss Warranty Act. It's actually created by a Utah senator in the 70s. Uh -huh. Really solid law. It's basically the same thing as the Lemon Law, it's just for used cars. Okay. Uh, for some reason, it's very unknown. I haven't heard of it. Very, very powerful law. Like yeah. if you buy a used car from a dealership, you basically have the same rights. Okay. As a, as That's a pretty cool. Um, can you text that to me or email it to me? Thanks. After you found his vehicle history report. So what I did here is I asked Robert if he'd give me his VIN. And so we're actually... So here's the VIN, so we're going to click on this report. So Robert... So this is his car. It's a Jeep, too. Branded title. Oh, what does that mean? What does it mean? Rebuilt salvage. It's been an accident. Yeah, it's been in an accident. I know some dealerships or some auto repair stuff, they'll find the car that's been smashed in the front and another one that's smashed in the back, and they'll cut the front and the back and put them back together. So salvage title, what are the risks here? Repairs. Yeah, repairs. <laughs> and you don't, you don't know how well, the quality of the work. Lasted. But if you didn't know this was a salvage title, would that be scary? People sometimes wonder why it's so cheap. There. Uh, I have a son-in-law who bought a uh, Toyota Tundra, which was a salvage title. And he thought he got a good deal, and after a year the paint started chipping. The paint started coming off. So be careful when you do these things. So there's, there's risks there here. Year purchased. Did you purchase in 2016? Yeah. Okay. Alert. Again, salvage title, no problem there. Loss reported. So here's the accident report, bottom right-hand sort. Total loss vehicle. It was declared a total loss. And then in Massachusetts, they actually fixed it, and it was fixed. And now a rebuilt title issue. Is this important to know if you're buying vehicles? That is. So, um, just, just be wise in the things that you do. Okay. Vehicle history report. Then you want to get it by a good mechanic. The downside is you want to get it by a good mechanic from that dealership. We were in the process, uh, daughter was just turning 16, we decided we wanted to get a teenage vehicle, and we looked at different ones and we thought, okay, let's do a, let's do it. Actually, that was a Jeep Cherokee. Sorry, let's, let's do a Jeep Cherokee. And so we, we found one, uh, we made the decision that we were gonna buy it, it was from some students. Um, so what we did is we took it down. Instead of taking it to the Jeep dealership, what we did is we just took it to a dealership just down here on Bulldog, just uh, left on Bulldog. And they went through and they did it. They did a compression check. They checked the suspension. They said, well, it's really in good shape, except there's two little things. Number one, you've got your, your front sway bar bushings are out. That'll cost you about $150 to fix. The other thing is you've got a rear axle bearing that's going out, and that'll cost you $250 to fix. So we've gone through the whole process. Everything that we teach here, that's what we did. You know, we did the car packs, we did all of these things here. So, we, we did that. Uh, they just says, okay, just take, take $400 off the price. And so we wrote them a check. 
No, my dad thought, we'll just go get the stuff fixed. So we took it into the Jeep dealership this time. Jeep dealer said, yep, you're right. Front sway bar bushings are out, so we'll, we'll replace those, 150 bucks. But it's not a rear axle bearing, it's a rear differential bearing. So instead of 250 bucks, it's 750 bucks. It wasn't too happy. So we fixed it, we drove it a little bit. We had family fly in from um, Delaware. And they said, hey, you wouldn't happen to have a vehicle. We're going up to Idaho, which is where they're from. And I said, sure, just go take the Jeep. So they took it, took the Jeep, and what we didn't realize is when we bought the vehicle, the front tires were brand new and the back tires weren't at the same time, and they weren't brand new. What does that tell you? Tires are going. What happens when you're in four-wheel drive and the tires are not the same size? It would stress. And so they drove up to Idaho. It wasn't bad. On the way back, it snowed like crazy. They were in four-wheel drive the entire time back from Idaho, back from Twin Falls. About Salt Lake, they started to get this really yucky smell and a really yucky wine. And so when they came back, they dropped the car off and said, sorry about that, and they hopped on a plane. <laughs> I had to figure out, and what had happened is when the wheels are, when the wheels turn at different speeds, it puts pressure on the drive lines. So we took it in and they said, sorry, you fried your front drive line. How much is that? 750 bucks. <laughs> so we weren't happy about that. And so four days later, I picked it up. And as I was driving away, I was hearing this noise. And I said, please, not another thing. So I turned around and took it back. And he said, well, when you fried your front drive line, you warped. Uh, fried, fried your front differential, you warped the drive line. And so we had to pick that. How much is that? 250 bucks. It was just not fun. So the lesson I learned is make sure you take it to a dealership a Ford dealership or whatever, the, the manufacturing dealership there are few of So my daughter turned 16 on Friday. We put her on the insurance on Monday. And on Tuesday, she pulled the car. <laughs> and thankfully, we got everything we put in and more out of it. So it, that worked out OK. <laughs> so <laughs> make sure you try to do a qualified mechanic. And then service records. My wife loves uh, Jiffy Lube because she's got records. And uh, I also like some of the dealerships now, for 90 bucks you can get three uh, oil chains and tire rotations, which are good too. But, but I, I will pay so much more for a vehicle that I have the records for. And if you're, in our family, our goal is to keep our vehicles 10 years or 200,000 miles, whichever comes first. So we're willing to put in the cost there too. Okay, why is the decision to buy a car so difficult? So it'd be easy, we just want to go from point A to point B. So everyone should all be driving in you know, a Toyota Prius. <laughs> Why is it so difficult? Different preferences. Different preferences. Of so many choices. So many choices. And, and it's, it's not that it's, it, in addition, it's a signal. It reflects our self-image by the car we drive. It signals to others how successful we are. It makes a statement about our lifestyle. And so the challenge is, uh, it's a tough decision. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that we don't spend more. So that brings us to our principles of effective car ownership. We've already talked about the first one. You know, know yourself, your vision, and your goals. The second one, always seek, receive, and act on the Spirit's guidance. What's kind of a third key principle here? Yeah, don't let your car determine your budget. Let your budget determine the car. And that's really the key. Yeah. And then I, I add this last one. Understand and minimize all costs. Purchase, fuel, repair, taxes, insurance, depreciation, and resources <coughs> over the car's effective life. Hopefully that effective life will be good and long. Mm -hmm. I had a friend, he says, Yo, I really like this Ford truck. He says, 35,000 miles. Haven't had to do anything. Haven't had to change the oil. <laughs> this <crazy. Yeah. laughs> You know, so be wise. Again, back to our doctors, the principles, we've talked about those. Again, identity, obedience, stewardship, agency, and accountability. And we're not just buying cars, what are we doing? 
choose good vehicles, minimize costs, maintain them well, and keep in mind a determined amount of time so I can accomplish my personal mission, individual and family business goals. Some people say they can't imagine a car without a car payment. I can't imagine a car with a car payment. I got a text from my daughter. Um, she's interested in buying the CRV from me. She asked this, when I buy the car from you, do you need all of the money for it up front, or can I pay in installments? How would you respond? I said, probably most, not all. I would like you to get in the habit of paying cash for your vehicle. Because that's what I want. So, okay. Any questions on key are areas of principles? Let me start with uh, 2012 Honda Civic. Um, once that Jeep Cherokee, we lost that one there. Um, we decided maybe we'll get a, a new vehicle, hopefully because we still had lots of kids going through this. Um, so we did our research, we did the things that we talked about, and we came up with a good car would be a, a Honda Civic. All we wanted was a radio and, uh, and air conditioning. Those, that's only the two things that we wanted. Um, how do you figure out what's the best way to get those details? We thought, well, why don't you let dealers compete? So what we did is we, we sent an email to six different dealerships, all the way up to Layton, all the way down to St. George, and we said, we're going to be buying a Honda Civic. This is what we want, just air conditioning and a radio. I'd like you to give us your lowest price out the door, and we're going to buy it on Saturday. And so I got sent off six ones. I got four emails back. And here's the thing. Do I really want to go up to Layton or Ogden or St. George to buy a vehicle? No. So what did I want those, those things for? I wanted leverage. So I took those and I went to the local Honda dealership here and I went to them and I said, hey, I'm going to buy a vehicle either today or Saturday. That, can you beat, beat this offer by 200 bucks? And actually, he, he went and talked to his manager. You notice they always have to go talk to their manager. <laughs> went and talked to the manager, came back and said, there's five cars out there, take your pick. So we walked out there, picked the one we went. We also paid 150 over, we did an extended warranty, paid 150 over the uh, extended warranty, and we were able to have a decent deal. So that's kind of what we teach, what we encourage. Let me share, a, another student came to me, he was from Thailand. And they were buying the car here for the first time. And he, he was pretty interested. He was actually a... A Mac student says, hi, professor, I did as we talked in your office by sending an email to all the dealerships. I actually set the out the door price for 20800 which is 200 lower than what we talked about. I thought, why not lower if I have nothing to lose? <laughs> I know I cut it really close since it's way below the invoice price already. I listed all the things I want, all the car specs, including the interest rate I want. I did mention that if they can't beat the interest rate I got from my credit union, I would not take it. I sent it out to all the Hyundai dealerships in Utah, except one in St. George. Within 10 minutes, I got three phone calls and four emails. I did turn down many of them at the end since they were not beating the price or asking for more than I put down. After 40 minutes, I got a dealership that beat the price for $200 lower. So the out-the-door price is $20,600, which is almost $5,000 below the invoice. As a total, I saved over $7,300 by just doing my homework. Following, following the slides and from your class, and one email to all dealerships. Thank you so much for chatting with me today and teaching a class that is really applicable in real life. Um, quick question. Will this negotiating tactic work on something new like a Ford Raptor or a Mustang, you know, a Shelby GT? No. But will it work with cars that are pretty generic and things like that? And the answer is yes. So what we need to do is we just kind of need to think, what are the things that we want? Let me finish this group with just an uh, email from, again, one of, one of the nephews. Again, I'm the go-to uh, go uncle for all the questions. And this is from Matt. He says, the second question I have is more for the future. I've heard many opinions on the subject, and I'm just curious of what yours is. When it comes to a vehicle, would you rather lease or buy? Just curious as we prepare for the future. What do you think? Would you rather lease or buy? So let's take you through the process. And then we will, we will go from there. So what is the process? Know the terminology. 
narrow your choices, pick your vehicle, determine your price, how do you finance, enjoy it. So, know the terminology. MSRP, what does that stand for? Manufacturer silly retail price. If you're silly enough to pay it, that they will be happy to take your money. That's kind of a, you know, kind of a, a, a recommended thing that they hope they get for it. Um, capitalized cost is just your agreed to or negotiated cost. So if the MSRP is 25 and you agree to 21, that's your capitalized cost. Uh, cost reduction is any reduction in your cap cost. So that can be a rebate, it can be a down payment, it can be a trade in. Uh, net capitalized cost is just your uh, capitalized cost minus your capitalized cost reduction. Residual value, that's what it's worth at the end of a period. So with a lease, what happens to you, say your capitalized cost is 20, your residual value is what it's worth at the end, and then you're just leasing it over that, that time period. So it's the expected value. Um, is, expe is your residual based on MSRP, or is it based on what you what your negotiated cost, your capitalized cost? So Nathan's a better negotiator than I am. So he gets it for 20, and I, I negotiated 21. Is the value of the vehicle at lease end still the same? Yeah, so it's, it's based on MSRP. And the lease term is just the number of months. Okay, narrow your choices, pick your vehicle. So compare and shop, be informed. Look at the alternatives, what's available in your price lane. This is my daughter Kylie, and that is her thing. Um, we had a white Patriot, and it got totaled until we were out looking for new cars. And so we thought, well, let's go by the dealership. So we went by the uh, Jeep dealership, and someone had just turned this car in two days before, two or three days before. And so we had the, the money from the previous car that had been totaled, so we had the insurance money. I think we had like 16. And they wanted like 21 for this, and we just said, you know, that's the way out. So they came down a little bit, and we went up a little bit, but we still couldn't, couldn't come to an agreement. And so our thought was, you know, it, it, it's just not going to work. It's just, it's just too much. And before we went, we, we said a prayer that helped us to be wise and help us we can find the right vehicle. Um, and it would just, we, they wouldn't come down and we wouldn't go up. And so we just said, okay, we're going to go. And so we walked. And sometimes that's your best negotiating tactic. So we went to this other place where we found a couple of other vehicles. We were, again, we were looking for a, a, another Jeep Patriot. We liked it. Um, and um, we looked at this one. This one had been, uh, it, 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 they had repainted it, you could tell, but it was a really decent price. And so we thought, well, we can get this, this roughly the same vehicle at the same price. And we were about, we took it for a test drive, and it, it worked out pretty well, it looked pretty good. Um, and we were about five minutes from signing the price, and I just got this feeling, you know what, call the original dealership. We called the dealership and said, hey, we're five minutes from buying this other vehicle here. Can you guys be aggressive on your pricing? We said, come back. So we came back, and they, they came down significantly more, and we went up just a little bit more. And we were able to get that. So as you, as you think through, make sure you're listening to the promptings of the Spirit. The promptings of the Spirit can really help you out. Uh, determine your total price and negotiate. Identify your come, do your homework, understand all rebuying, understand holdback, understand dealer invoice. Once you have that information, it's, so, it's a much easier to, to negotiate. Then you start negotiations at the dealer's price. So this is a, a 2006 Ford Explorer. We had our Suburban, we had 188,000 miles, and there was someone who needed the car more than we did, and so we sold it for really cheap. Uh, my, my wife was getting ready to take the kids down to Disneyland. And what we had done is we'd gone to the car show. We, we had already been out to the Ford dealership, and they had an expedition there, and we really liked it. Uh, we made them a, a kind of a lowball offer on it. And the dealer says, you know, Brian, he says, he says you know, he said, I wouldn't be making any money on it. I took the offer, so I put my arm and pulled him close, and I said, John, I promise I won't force you to get money. But what we did is we found there was only one other dealership that had a black... Uh, Ford Expedition, the one that we wanted. We wanted rating boards, we wanted some, some things like that. And we found that it was in, uh, it was in Lake, a place called Ed Kenley Ford. Uh, and we had just been to the, 
been to the auto show there at Sandy, and we had talked with one of the people there too. So just for fun, we just called them up and said, hey, I know you've got a black expedition. Um, we would be interested in purchasing it. And he goes, fine. But what, 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 uh, you know, what price are you willing to pay? So why is, why is that a critical? Why don't they just say, oh, this is the price? Why did he say, what price are you willing to pay? Because he wanted us to set the price first. So where's our good place to start? So we said, MSR, or we said invoice minus five hundred dollars. And they cough. We said, let me go talk to my manager. You know, they always cough. And so, so we we put it on, put it on hold. And when he came back, we took it off hold there. He came back and he said, okay, invoice plus five hundred dollars. And I kind of coughed just for fun. I said, well, let me talk with my wife. And we put it on hold for a few minutes, just so he had to wait, just like we did too. And so we kind of just kind of talked for a little bit. And we just said, okay. Talk, said, how about we do invoice minus two hundred? She said, sure. So we, well, I said, how about invoice minus two hundred dollars? And he coughed. He said, let me go talk to my manager. So he put us on hold. You know, so we're listening to his music. And, uh, then when he came back, <laughs> he says, how about invoice plus two hundred dollars? <laughs> and so <laughs> I kind of coughed and said, well, let me talk with my wife. <laughs> and so we talked, and she says, well, that's not a bad price, assuming that I can get the car tomorrow. Because the next day we were, she was going to take the kids to Disneyland, so she wanted to do that. And we just said, to, I says, okay, we'll do invoice plus two hundred dollars, but we don't want to drive all the way up to Layton. What we want you to do is meet us in Salt Lake, and you bring the vehicle and we'll write a check. And so the next day in Madison Salt Lake, at, at a uh, Wendy's, we treated him and his wife to dinner. So he drove the car, she drove another car. We wrote, we wrote him a check. Uh, Treated him to dinner, and we drove back. And my wife did that. It, uh, you know, drive, drove the car back, and I drove, it, uh, drove our car back. But it was interesting. We never set foot in the in the dealership. My wife, about three weeks later, she got a call, and someone says, "Well, well how, what was, how was your experience coming to Ed Kenley Ford?" And she goes, "I don't know. We've never been there." But but realize there's a lot of different things with the way life is, and negotiating in these things is is important. And then financing, if you've got a finance, which I hope you don't do. Sorry, real quick. You just say, how do you find the invoice price again? Okay, you can actually go to kbb.com, you can go on the end there, or you can ask them for it too. Okay. George? Is the invoice price, is that how much they paid? How much yeah, they were invoiced by the manufacturer for? It's roughly how much they paid, but they've got that, they've got that hole back too, so they actually paid less than that. So even if you're buying it for below invoice, they're probably still making money on it. And then maintain your purchase. I do your oil change every three to 5,000 miles. We do it religiously. Realize if you're going to keep your vehicles for 10 years, you want to take good care of it. We do all the transmission things. Yes? On the financing, um, is your reasoning on not doing financing, is that really just because you're paying more? If you yeah, if you pay more. If you finance it or lease it? Yep. And I like to stay out of debt. And are you, are you suggesting buy used? In, or in particular, or buy new or used? Or? So generally what we've done, uh, Dave Ramsey said you shouldn't buy new until you have a net worth of three quarters of a million dollars. I, you know, and you guys will figure that out for yourself. In our case, I've been more concerned with my wife with seven kids. The last thing I want her to do is be stranded up on a, uh, on a bridge or a freeway someplace. And so what we did is we'd buy that car new, and then at 130,000 miles that became my new car. So my wife was just joking about, yeah, the expedition was good until you got it. <laughs> so then I'd drive it for another 70,000 miles. But I mean, you guys can figure out your own strategies, but I mean, that's just one, one of the ones that we did. And then maintain that purchase. Don't ignore warning signs. Get a good garage check training experience. But, but if you can be wise. Jessica. I just have a question. So if you don't do, uh, get a loan on your car, uh -huh. so I was talking to people at like Mount Saint America and then like if you don't have like four different lines of credit when you go to purchase your first home, you have to like add on additional like insurance or something because you don't have like your credit score is going to be really low because your home is full line. You have to have four lines of credit to get to get a decent credit score. And the answer is no that's a fake interest rate. Um, as long as your credit score is roughly seven fifty, seven sixty, you're in the you're in the highest rate. So one thing that we found, Ryan, is, and we've done, so we grew up with only used cars, like, mm -hmm. 
We had one that was in front of the French Stone Park and you lifted up to the road and <laughs> that's what I grew up with. And so it was really, really hard for my husband to um, be willing to pay the price to pay for a new car. And um, and one time we went in and we're looking around and same thing, I've got four kids, so I didn't really want something that I was having to repair was broken down. My neighbor always gets used and they always have one broken down. And so I don't you know, I think there's a big there's balance there that you wanna think about. Um, but it was right after the last recession and so used cars were really high in price. And um, we found that for a slightly used car, there's only about seventeen hundred dollars difference between used and new and so that That's was kinda of like that Honda Civic, that there was only mm -hmm. like a very small differential. Yeah, so that so that's one thing kind of to look at. Um, so how the economy is doing will impact it. Um, and then uh, another time we went in and we bought it, and interest rates were so low. It was, I think we got like point one or maybe it was point nine percent interest rate. So we were actually making more just having it sitting in a savings account than what we were paying. And we did that. We didn't do it for very long. I, I mean, maybe. I don't even know if we had a year because we were like you, we don't really want to be in debt and it wasn't really worth it, but it was, it was just kind of fun, just mm -hmm. the fact that we're paying less on our car interest rate than we are um, having it set in the bank. But anyway, so just different things to look at because I yeah. think it, part of it does depend on, you know, the, what the economy is doing, where you're at, what your credit score is, there's a lot of... Uh, for example, when we bought our 2016 Explorer, they said, well, are you going to pay cash or finance? We said, we're going to pay cash. He says, well, if you'll finance part of it, we'll give you 250 off. I said, well, how long do I have to finance it for? They said, three weeks. <laughs> so I financed okay. half of it for, yeah. for three weeks, and yeah. we got $250 okay. off, and three weeks later, we paid it off. So <laughs> all of these things, if I could have gotten it for 0% interest, I would have done that, and I would have just I would take the money out of this account every month to take it, and I would have continued to get my got my interest on it, too. Just, so, make, just make sure you pay it off like a good month or yeah. so before it's due. We yeah. did that on our computer out of yeah. college. We, it was 0% financing, but yeah. you want to make sure you pay it off so that they yeah. don't, because they'll ding your heart if you go yeah. even a little a day bit past yeah. yeah. Okay. Questions on general guidelines? Okay, let's, let's go on to leasing. What are the challenges of leasing? Go ahead, Tyler. Or is it true that like, the last day of the month, or you were talking about end of quarter. End of quarter, course. end of years are good times. So if my daughter buys buys my CRV, we'll probably get a car about the last week of December, just because I think that'll be a good time. So when you buy it, has an impact. So what are some of the challenges of leasing? Yeah. A lot of the time, there's there's mileage restrictions. Mileage restrictions. And, yeah. and you go over the miles and it's like 15 cents, it can be 10 to 20 cents a mile. Other, other, other concerns. Here's just some that I thought about. Generally costs more due to higher interest rates. Ones in the leasing habits, payments going for other, forever. Fixed mileage, you gotta maintain it in good condition. I'm amazed these people will lease a vehicle for five years, but their warranty is only for two years. So they're at risk those last two years. End of contract, you don't own the car, and extra fees, listen problem, high early termination penalties. This is going to be as much as 5% of the value. So if you have a $50,000 vehicle at termination, you could be 2,500 in early termination fees. So, so be wise when you do this. It's really important that, that you're wise. So what do we do? First, negotiate the price from the lease type. Two different types of lease type. One is called a closed end or walk away lease. As long as the car's in relatively good condition and clean, at the end of the lease period, you walk away. For many businesses, though, they prefer what's called an open-end lease. So they have an estimate of what the value is at the end of the lease term. And if the value of the vehicle is less than that, and with an open-end, the, the, the person who leases the vehicle has to pay the difference. Or if the value is greater than that, they actually get the money back, too. What's the other benefit for uh, leasing for businesses? You can expense it out. Which, which with a car, uh, which with, with a non lease vehicle, you can only depreciate it out you know, over five years. Um, two, select the lease terms. So generally what happens is you'll get a depreciation schedule like this for your vehicle. I think you can find these in most by Kelly Blue Book and different places like that. So here we're, we're looking at 36 months. 
So 43%, so the residual value is 57%. So you, you can, um, you affect, now notice where most of the depreciation comes in the first 12 months. So 25%, at least with this vehicle. Third thing you do is you calculate your residual value. So there's a lot of residual value guides, but residual value is how much is the vehicle worth at the end of the lease period. So that's kind of the critical thing. So, for example, if you had a 22,000 MSRP, the residual value was 57%. The residual value is multiplied that, so $12,540. That's your residual value. Four, you need to calculate your lease costs. There's four different types of lease costs. Number one, first one is fees, front and back end fees. Notice taxes, tags, and license, that's consistent for a lease or a buy. But a lease will, will, leases will often have acquisition costs and termination costs. And so realize those can be significant. These are also added to your net capitalized <coughs> cost. Number two, your usage. So your usage is this. It's the amount that you're using. Let's go use our example here. Let's say your net capitalized cost, let's say it's 20 and your residual value is 50%, at the end of the lease, how much is your car worth? 10. 10. So what's, what's your usage? The usage is the difference between your net capitalized cost and your residual value. So that's your usage. So in our example here, 20,000 is your net cap cost, 12,540 is your residual, so 740 total. That is your usage or your depreciation. You divide that by the number of periods and that becomes your monthly period. The next thing we do is interest cost. Now interest is quite a bit different. With a traditional loan, it's pretty easy. The way leases do interest, it is your net capitalized cost plus the residual times your money factor which is your APR divided by 24. Truthfully, I think it was a way of hiding interest rates. But let's see if we can kind of help you understand that it goes like this. So if this is your average amount borrowed, how do you, or excuse me, how do you calculate your average amount borrowed? How do we calculate that here? What is the average amount bar we borrowed over the life of this lease? Is it 20? Is it 20? No. no. Is it 10? No. What is it? Is it 15? That's your average amount borrowed. Okay, how did we get to that average amount borrowed? Net capitalized cost plus the residual divided by 2. Are you comfortable with that? Okay, and then what's our APR? That's our interest rate divided by 2. Does that give you your monthly interest monthly interest rate? So if you do net capitalized cost plus residual divided by two, this is the average amount borrowed times your average interest rate. And let's just redo the terms. And that's your money factor. So it's really just a way of calculating your interest rate. So our interest rate so net capitalized cost plus residual times the money factor, it's just average amount borrowed times your average interest rate. So what we do, so here's our net capitalized cost, our residual divided by two. So it gets 81.35. So remember it's APR divided by 24 regardless of the months of the lease, Ethan. Okay, how come it's divided by 12 So this is your APR divided by 12 months. So we're, we're calculating the and monthly interest, interest cost. Add 12 under APR on the board. On the whiteboard. Oh, sorry. It's 12 or 24? Yeah. 12. So, you're right. Sorry. And then 2 times 12 just gives us our 24. Okay. Good catch. Okay, so that's how we calculate with our monthly interest cost, and you multiply that times the month. And then how do we calculate our taxes? It's really just your usage plus your interest <coughs> times whatever your tax rate divide that. And so our total cost here would be. We add each of those up and that would come up with your monthly costs. 
So a way to check this is just using Learning Tool 2. But look at our monthly cost. This one, 306 versus 646. Do you get a sense why people like a leased vehicle? Okay. So how do we develop our transportation plan? Do you need to have one? Think about it. If you're leasing a new vehicle every three years, are you paying the highest cost of the vehicle? Yeah, every three years you get a new one. Are you paying the highest depreciation? Yeah, because the highest in the first three years. Are you paying the highest insurance? You are. So, what happens if you don't have a strategy? You borrow and you pay interest in it. You get in the habit of leasing it, so you're continually paying interest costs. Because you spend more on the budget, it relegates your other goals to a lesser importance. So your vision is likely from your plan for life. What are some goals that you might have for your auto plan? I like it to get from point A to point B reliably. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Normally that's the way it was in our family, and then my dad, he had to get a car that looked nice because he was the general contractor, it had to look like he was. He couldn't just drive his, his green pickup like the rest of us. But here's just some ideas. Ensure the auto fits the budget, not the budget fits the auto. Keep your cars 10 years or 200,000 miles, whichever comes first. It's, it's a little bit harder now that we're empty nesters. Because before, my wife would put 30,000 miles a year on the car, just taking the kids to stuff. With seven kids, and we played soccer, and we played soccer all over the western United States. Maintenance, oil changes every three to 5,000 miles, and recommended financing pay cash for all vehicles. New car purchase will buy used vehicles until our net worth is 750,000. What's George? the 10-year, 200,000 mile standard based on? It's just me. That's what I just thought. That's kind of a logical thing. Most cars will last 200,000, especially the newer ones. And we've, we've done it for the last 20 years. Um, Is that the same uh, idea, like around transaction costs? Like it takes yeah, so a lot of work to sell a car, it takes a lot of work um, to sell a car. Once you're using it, yeah, The reason for it, being is you, um, most of the cars will handle it. And if you take good care of them, they will do well. Um, we, we sold our Suburban with 188000 to a family who really needed a new car. Uh, our Expedition we gave to my daughter at 198000 Well, that, that Suburban is still going strong now and it's close to 300,000 miles. Um, Expedition my daughter drove for three or four years and then used this as a down payment on another vehicle. Um, but the cars will do that. And if you don't have to pay the high upfront costs, um, it can be so much better. So generally what we'll do is we will get a an extended warranty, 100,000, or a five-year, 100,000-mile warranty. And so any of the major costs will go that. And after 100,000, we just try to take, take good care of the vehicle. And I just, it's just a lot smarter, I think. It reduces your costs. So plans and strategies. You see, you're going to have to put yours together. But these are just ideas. These are just some ideas. Check it out. You know, even when you do everything right, when we talked about that Jeep Cherokee, you know, we. we Tried to do everything. We took it to a dealership. We did the Carfax. We did all of this stuff. Even when you do that, there's still problems, still concerns. But you can minimize the risk by doing your homework. So what are we going to do? If my daughter buys a Civic from us, we'll probably buy an F-150 truck. We'll probably do it in November, uh, you know, December, about the last week in December. Yeah? If you do get new, is it as important to check up with the mechanics and everything? Or? No. New, because you got your three or 36,000 miles. But what? If I buy a vehicle that's one year old, is the warranty still good for two more years? Yeah. And can I take that vehicle into a dealership and get an extended warranty for five years to you know, 70000 The answer is yes. Okay, and then constraints, accountability. Again, the, the big challenge in automobiles is when, instead of uh, vehicle, pride gets in the way. We have, we're worried about how we look to the neighbors. You realize most of your neighbors don't care. Okay. How about your toy strategy? I know of people who go into significant debt to buy their toys. And it's really sad, whether it's boats or whether it's 
ATVs or things like that. It doesn't mean you can't buy these things, but you buy them at the right time. We had a, a, a Polaris 900, um, and it was kind of falling apart. And my wife came to me, I was 62, she says, you know what, we're hitting our goals for savings, we're hitting our goals for things, why don't you just go buy it the razor you want? And then she said these immortal words, because it'll be the last one you will ever buy. Because <laughs> at age 82, am I going to want to go out and get a new razor? And the answer is probably no. So I got the roll bar, or I got the, the light bar, I got the winch, I got the metal box on the back, and I got the a spare tire carry on. So if you see a, a razor that has two BYU flags on, that's ours. Um, but the point is, the strategies don't mean that you can't do it. It just means you should do it at the right time. You know, I have a goal to be the favorite grandpa, you know, and just, I mean, I say that for fun, and so I, I want to be able to do these things. So what's the purpose of toys? Be the favorite grandpa. Yeah, be the favorite grandpa. <laughs> but with, with your kids, I mean, we grew up, we started with bikes, then we went to camping equipment, then we went into a, a little trailer, a pop-up trailer with my, with my dad, and then we kind of moved to, uh, you know, different things, you know, small ATVs. In fact, I still have the... Suzuki 80 for our kids who are young, and now the grandkids are riding the same thing. So it's really kind of fun. But, but you need to have a strategy. So here's just some thoughts. Uh, we used to buy these go kart slash doom buggies, Chinese ones. You could get them for a reasonable price, and they were really fun. It's just you could never get parts for them. I bought another one that was US based, and then uh, the the company went out of business, so I couldn't get parts for that. And so I finally decided, go with a, de a, a kind of a big dealership or a big name that you can get parts for. So, you know, I still have a 2002 and a 2003, or a 2002 Polaris, and I can still get parts for it. And so, finding good toys that you can get parts for, because you're going to keep them for 20 years. So what it does, too, is you don't allow other people to use them unless, number one, they can fix them in case they break them, or if they take good care of them. So, just being wise there. Okay, constraints. Okay, at the beginning we said we're going to start, we shared the story. So let's divide the class into two groups. In fact, we're going to do Nathan here on over, you guys are going to do Lease. Tyler here on over, you guys are going to be Phi. Michael's going to help his wife on the buy side. So she's going to decide solely on costs. So the good news is you guys have your computers. You can actually go ahead and take a look at it. If you really want to look, if you look at Learning Tool 22, Learning Tool 22 has a, a spreadsheet that can kind of help you figure those things out. But let's give you five minutes, and then we'll work on it. We'll work on it together. So realize this type of question is likely going to be on the quiz. Is it okay to use the learning tools on the quiz? Of course. Because again, high learning and, and low stress. But I would recommend that you use the learning tools before to make sure you understand them. And I, I would use the learning tools just kind of to check up on you. Is that, is it by percent APR or is it by percent over those three years? Right, so it's 55% is your residual value. So if you multiply that times your MSRP, that will give you the dollar residual value. Did the roll make it around? The roll someplace? Oh, okay. I don't, you know, oh, we can go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 
realize we're going to pay cash for it. Cash for the down payment, the taxes on down payment, and fees. Now, these fees, are those fees taxable? Actually, what I found is the fees aren't taxable. So it's just kind of unique. You guys got the roll? Yeah? Everyone got it? I didn't Okay. Funding about teenagers, because of all the teenagers, we wrecked a lot of cars and we have lots of stories about buying cars. <laughs> My goal to keep my slides to 50, uh, I did a section on how do you buy a used car. Um, it's about 30 slides on its own, or 20 slides on its own, so I just put that at the end as uh, problem number three. So if you want more detail on buying a used car. Okay. Leasing people. So tell us about what, what you did first. Do we want to put the information in first and see what you, see, see what we get first, or do you want to do your stuff first? I'll just put it all in for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what the, what the MSRP, tell me what it is. $25,000. Capitalized cost? $22,000. Down payment? $2,000. Interest rate? 8.35. Sales tax? 6.25. Lease period? 36 months. Residual value? 55%. Acquisition and termination? Total 800. Document fee? 200. License and registration? 185 total. 
Okay. So let's, let's go through the cost of leasing with <laughs> Let's take us through that. So we start with down payment and fees, and our assumption was that you pay those outside the lease. So $2,000 down payment, do you have to pay the taxes on that? Yes, you do. And then we have our fees, acquisition, registration, license, documentation, and terminology. So they paid $3,300 out, out, uh, outside of the lease. Now realize, are those fees taxable? Actually, I went through on, uh, I looked at a number of different lease things, and those things are not taxable. So I thought that was interesting there. And then what we're doing, our lease payments, so our usage is $20,000 minus $13,750 gives us our $62,50. Our interest came up to $42,27. Taxes, $6,55. Let's bring this up a little. Six fifty-five, and that that gives fourteen forty-two, and that gives us three hundred nine a month. So did we did does the spreadsheet work okay? Okay. So now let's go to let's go to the the other one. Cost of buying, we did the same thing. Two thousand with your down payment. We brought the taxes. Notice the fees are not as high. What are the two fees that buying does not have? Acquisition or, or termination fee. So, you've got 20,000 to finance, so you have to add your remaining taxes. So we're gonna finance that in. Notice our payments are 669.33. It's not cheap. So notice, Total cost was 1442 versus 2606. Leasing beats it every time, right? What's the difference? You have a car at the end. You have a car at the end. <laughs> so let's make an assumption that the value of the car is the same as the residual value, and now we can actually change it out. So 12856 versus 1442. Now, the nice thing about what we've done here is now we can actually say, what are the differences here? So let's look here. So additional fees, you've got 800 additional fees. That's the, the benefit there is fine because you don't have those. Notice with interest, with interest, um, you, when you buy, it's amortized over the life of the loan. So a buy is actually paying less interest than, than lease. However, which pays more, which pays more taxes? The buy pays more taxes than the lease. And so if we kind of compare each of those, so basically additional fees, interest and taxes, that comes to 56 versus 4 So about, about $1,600 difference. Does but that if, make it? But if you take the interest out and just pay cash for it, you're way ahead. Um, right? <coughs> if you pay cash for the car versus. Oh, it, it, you would be the same thing. You, 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 basically, the, 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 you could. So you're not leasing it, you're just paying cash for the car. Right. Right, right. So, so if you paid cash for it, you wouldn't go through this exercise. But right. this exercise really is just to say, if you do lease versus buy, buy it's better. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes? Well, there, like, I mean, there's obviously like factors, uh -huh. like qualitative factors that would right. might lean toward leasing and stuff. Right, 309 right. versus 669. That's probably the big one. Right. And realize if you're a business, you can you can expense out the lease costs instead of advertise it over five years. So business versus an individual is different. Remember, if I leased, I couldn't have put those wide tires on my car so I could stop faster. Couldn't have put the roll bar on it. Uh, but at least in, I couldn't worry about 88,000 miles on it just because the lease has those limitations. Okay, takeaways. Takeaways for today. Ethan. Um, one I had was when in negotiations, kind of using the invoice price as kind of your anchor. Yeah, in, in, in negotiation, use the invoice price as your anchor. That's a good start. And when they don't, when they don't, they say, okay, what are you willing to pay? Start low. <laughs> Other takeaways. Right. I like how you said 
walking away can be your best negotiating yeah. tool. Because sometimes we feel, you know, we're there, we have to make a decision by the end of that, and we really don't. Yeah. Walking away sometimes is your best negotiation decision. Other takeaways. Katrina, what's your takeaways from today? This is a lot of what we already live by. Okay. So a lot of it fits right with what we believe in. Okay. Um, I think it's important mm -hmm. to let your budget fit the car and not the car the budget. Let your budget fit the car and not the car your budget. Trey, what is your takeaway? That was my main one. Okay. Too. Let's do one more. Who haven't I picked on in a while? Hugh, you got a big smile on your face. You're the only thing between. Well, this is like a more personal thing, but I actually purchased a used car last week, and I feel good about how I did it. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> we, we confirmed uh, what you're already doing. Yeah. Which is the same thing with Kachinder says. So here's my takeaways for to do for today. Number one, even when you do it right, there's still rest. Strive to understand as much as you can, and you can minimize those risks. Number two, understand the real purpose of a vehicle. Try hard not to make it a question of pride. And number three, if you really want to get, get a good deal in a good car, counsel with the Lord. We can do the best we can with his help. And I have to admit that, that when we got our car, we, we did so much better with the Lord's help than on our own. Thanks, everyone. We will see you on Monday.